at your tabletop this morning. Well, I want to welcome you. I'm so thankful to celebrate worship with you today. It's a full house. My goodness, I see ushers kind of getting chairs everywhere. We've been polling uh, parts of our church and our volunteer base here the last couple of weeks to try to figure out how we're going to continue to take these steps in reopening. And you're casting your vote today. I know there's an election coming in November, but you're casting your vote by being in attendance today and, and by being online as we continue to navigate this time as a church. So I'll be looking for information here as we kind of get through September. September's kind of a broken up month. There's the Labor Day holiday next week. There's a couple Sundays that are, get disrupted by uh, the fall break with the schools, and, and a lot of folks are traveling. Um, so we're kind of making our plans in September as to how we're going to continue to navigate church in person and online uh, as we go through September. So hang with us here, and we'll continue to make more room as you continue to, to re-engage here in person and continue to stay engaged online. And I just want to, again, say thank you, for, thank you for, for checking us out online. If you're viewing from home today or you're uh, checking this, this video, this message out uh, on replay throughout the week, uh, statistics say that one out of three folks that were engaged with the church prior to the corona outbreak are no longer engaged whatsoever. So if you're persevering online because you're continuing to kind of shelter in place in some way, I just want to, I want to encourage you to stay the course, stay motivated, continue to keep your, your connection to the church so you can stay encouraged. And I want to encourage all of us to encourage all those online and welcome all those that are viewing from afar. Thank you so much for viewing from where you are. Well, we're in this series here today that we're concluding after this month called Drained, and we've been in this, um, this look at how this time of life, this season of life has really drained us. We looked at the first week of how we're spiritually drained, and we looked at the spiritual significance of how seasons like this can pull us down and pull us away. And there's a spiritual aspect was how we looked at the first week of this series. And the second week, Tara and I spoke together about how we're physically drained in the season, even though in some ways we're probably less active than we've ever been. We might be taking some more walks, but a lot of us are working from home, we're, we're, we're stationing kind of through the house, doing a lot more video calls, and, and we, we, our, our sedentary style of life has, has, has created some physical draining inside of us that we need to remedy. And Tara and I together kind of team taught that two weeks ago, how you can remedy that. And then last week, Tara spoke, and she talked about how we're mentally and emotionally drained in this season. If you haven't seen one of those three messages, we'd really encourage you to go back through our podcast to check that out. Now, I want to look specifically today at how through this season, through this, this sheltering in place, this corona season, through the, the, the economic hardship that we've faced, we're now facing a financially drained feeling. And it's, it, it, it's, it's interesting to see who has been affected by the economic downturn because there have been some industries that have upticks and certainly Folks that are in attendance today that have lost their jobs throughout the season, there has been severe unemployment uh, that's gone throughout the season that has created some financial draining. Whether it's you, you haven't been affected and you're concerned with how the future may play out for your life or you have been affected. And regardless of how maybe there's been some stimulus you know, checks that have gone out to help this time frame or maybe you had unemployment for a season or maybe you were able to access mortgage deferment or had rental relief or even delayed your taxes, in some ways that help has probably been utilized and now that help is done. So if you are needing that help or utilize that help, now you're kind of on your own. And we're in this time frame where there's this extra pull on people that we're seeing inside of our community. Now, it's interesting because here we are talking about this, and today we're celebrating our sixth anniversary as a church. And <laughs> yeah, it's about how I feel too. Like, what happened? It's six years? Like, we're celebrating that today? How did this sneak up on me? And it was funny because Tara was investigating what is the typical traditional six-year anniversary gift, and it's iron. So if you haven't been married for six years yet, you can, you can, you can celebrate the, 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 the iron gift, and, and I think as a gift today, you're going to get this piece of iron as you walk out. If you're watching online today and you're not in person, if you'll comment happy anniversary or whatever, we'll be sure to follow back up with you and send you one of these iron keychains as a gift. But we wanted to celebrate with you on what we're celebrating is our six-year anniversary, and I think it's kind of ironic that in this difficult, drained season, we're trying to celebrate what, what is supposed to be a, a, a happy time, right? And then this snuck up on me. I'll be honest. We, we were kind of planning this out the last several weeks, and I thought, like, it's coming up now. Like, we're supposed to be celebrating and 
having cupcakes and sharing memories, and there's, there's pictures on all your tables of the last six years, and I took this one because this was our, our frozen event. This is me and my wife posing with Anna and Elsa, and I didn't want any of you to see that one, so this one is mine up here, but there's, there's pictures of the last six years of our church on the tables, and I thought, man, this, this doesn't feel like a celebration because I think I feel drained, you probably feel drained, I see drained people everywhere, and it just, it, it's, it's, it's ironic that iron is the celebration gift. And iron literally means, and I thought this was so significant, I, the significance of iron being the six-year anniversary gift is it's supposed to symbolize the strength of a loving bond. And that's probably why inside of your first six years, you need some iron-clad tendencies to a marriage and some iron-clad hope in, in your relationship with Christ and your, your family at church because there's a lot more road to, to hoe, right, to really make this a a full marriage together, a full life together. There's a lot more ways to go. And I just think for, for 2020, as tough as it's been, this is, this is such a, an ironic symbolism to how we need to remedy the, the drained feeling that we have in our life right now. So Proverbs chapter 27, it's the fabled verse about how iron is present in our life. And as we we're talking about this as a creative team and how to present this idea to, to encapsulate this series, to celebrate uh, uh, the church turning six years old to really help to give you maybe the roadmap to walk out of here and to lift some of that drained feeling on your life. I was reminded of this verse, and, and we've, we've probably all read this before, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens, say it with me, another. And what's important about this is it takes two pieces of iron, in other words, two people for the sharpening to happen. And as I looked at this verse here in the NIV version, the NLT, the New Living Translation, gives a little bit of a, of a more friendly version here. As iron sharpens iron again, so a friend sharpens a, a friend. And it makes it more personal. It's not just one and another, but it's two having the same purpose, the same calling. I looked further into other translations. Other translations has, as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens the countenance of a friend. The friend sharpens the mind of a friend. The friend sharpens the character of a friend. Another translation said, as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens the wit of a friend. I would like some better wit. My wife is witty. My whole life is just pitching up softballs to her that I've spent three days thinking about, and she just dings them right back at me. I pick up that one. I go back to my room. I think, and I hem and haw, and then I come up with another one, and she dings it right back at me. So I'm hoping that one day... One day, I'm going to catch the wit that she has. I have not gotten that yet. She must not be as friendly to me as I am to her. But anyway, that's for another, another topic. Another translation was, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens the face of another. How would you like that as you get older? Some natural Botox and face lifting, huh? You just got to get in there and have irony with one another. And the last translation I found was, as a friend sharpens a friend, it sharpens the person of another. And I thought, man, how, how great is that? That as you connect with someone else, as you, as you engage in this relationship with Christ and this, this pursuit of faith, that as iron sharpens iron, the person who you are can become stronger. My MacArthur commentary says that iron sharpens iron, and it's, it defines it as the benefit of intellectual discussion that encourages the joy through a keener mind and the improvement of good character, which the face will reveal. So you can see how that scripture is trying to pull out the wit, the character, the countenance of your face because your face becomes the window to our soul and really the, the thermometer to how our engagement in our spiritual life is really happening on the inside. So my hope today is that we'll help you to grow in your next step of God by helping you realize that iron is a white that actually strengthens and straightens things out. That like an iron will, will iron a shirt as you engage with others, as iron sharpens iron, it helps to straighten it helps to strengthen, it helps to bring out the best of you, but it takes engagement. And usually a season of draining forces disengagement. It forces you to retreat into a hole and to, to pull back and to isolate yourself. It's the exact opposite of what God wanted you to do when you needed more forming to take place. So if you've got your note sheets today, they're available on your table. If you're tracking along with us online, taking some notes, I hope you'll, you'll track along with us here because I, I want to share a story that you've probably read in a completely different context in the past. It's a well-told well parable in Scripture, 
In a lot of ways, I think it's mishung. And as we look at this draining season that we're in, as we look at the celebration of a church that we're in, as we look to try to empower our community and our country through a time of division, through a time of, of not having a connection that's sharpening, but a, a connection that's withdrawing and dulling one another, I want us to look at this passage here in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. And I love the way this passage starts off because Jesus is telling the story and he's painting a picture. And he says again, in other words, I've already told you the story once, but allow me to tell you again in a different way because y'all didn't get it the last time I told you. So this gives me confidence that Jesus had to remind people in person that you and I are still missing out on the message here today. So here's this idea. Again, say it with me, the... So he's about to tell a story that's just like what it's going to be like when we get there in heaven. So again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. And Jesus is telling the illusion of one day I'm going to leave you and I'm going to come back. Jesus is still gone on his long trip. So he called together his servants. Everybody say, that's me. That's That's you. That's me. He called his servants and entrusted his money to them, excuse me, while he was gone. Now, if you ever thought that financially your financial life was independent of your spiritual life, allow this scripture here to, to help you to realize that how you steward your money, how you handle your finances is actually a spiritual act. And I'm not even talking about giving right now. I'm talking about how you handle your paycheck, the whole paycheck. The way you handle what he calls his money, not yours, what he gave you, what he entrusted you with is a spiritual act. And if you have the physical, mental, emotional, drained feeling right now, it might be because you're not handling the way he intended the kingdom of heaven to operate. The passage goes on in verse 19, and it says that after a long time, the servant's master returned from his long trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. What's interesting about this passage is that apparently God is keeping track of how you keep track. He's keeping track of your trip to racetrack. He's keeping track of, of how you utilize money towards fun and towards savings and towards retirement. He's keeping track of how you engaged his money. So how are you engaging his money? Well, if we backtrack through the, the, the story here and we go back to verse 15, he gives this distribution. And it's interesting because he gave five bags of silver to one of the servants. He gave two bags of silver to another servant and one bag of silver to the last servant, dividing it Okay, you kind of you fell off there. I, I think some of you are like, man, why did I end up being the last servant who only got one bag of silver? So you got, you got to the point where you're supposed to read and you disqualified yourself. So I'm going to start again when we get to the highlighted part. If you missed it in the first couple times, that's where you all kind of say it together as well as you online. So the, the man who went on a long trip, who's symbolic of what it's going to look like in heaven, he gave five bags of silver to one servant, two bags of silver to another servant, and one bag of silver to the last servant, dividing it... And there's where we start looking at, well, see, there's where we're not common, like you, like you talked about in the, in the offering segment, Pastor, that there's where there is diversity and difference among us people here on the earth. That's why we see the divide when, when shootings and, and responses and protests like the shootings happen. And there's where we're, we're on social media, we continue to part the seas of, of God's children and begin to create division throughout our whole country because we think that God divided us when in actuality... He started you somewhere, but he also gave you the ability to expand where you're at. He gave you the ability to grow beyond your initial limitations, because he never looked at what you have as a limitation. He looked at your ability to expand where you're at and grow into the faith that he's given you, the faith of a mustard seed that could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'd be so. So how do I know that? Well, if we look all the way now to the end of the passage in verse 21... This is after the servants had, had done what they had done with their, with their resources, the money that, that the Lord had given them as, as he went about his, his long journey. He comes back to find a couple of the servants had done well, so he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not only did you do a good job, but you were faithful to what I asked of you. You have been faithful in handling the small account, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's. So God's a partier. God, there you go, yeah. Now we're excited. Before you're talking about in proportion to my abilities, I want a party though. I got great ability there. So w- welcome back. Uh, so God wants to party. 
And I'll be honest, I always looked at this passage through the wrong context prior to this week because I looked at this passage as this was probably what St. Peter was going to say to me after I lived my life and died my natural death here on earth and got to go to heaven. That St. Peter would be at the gate and he'd say this phrase, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. You were a good Christian. You were faithful to your wife. You raised your sons and you, you fulfilled the calling and the purposes I placed in your life to serve in this, in this earth. Come on in and enter the Lord's joy. And there I was reminded that the only time in Scripture that we're told, well done, a good and faithful servant, is in response to how we handle our finances, our whole finances, not just our giving, but our our whole paycheck. Like God wants to know that we did something well in this earth with all of his money. And it's interesting because what what I was misconstrued about this passage is really going to become the introduction to what we're going to get into in September. September, we're going to introduce a series in a couple weeks uh, entitled, Did Jesus Really Say That? And it's kind of interesting because a lot of us live by ideology. It's the thought that we have that we think is good and true and right, and it's probably scripture. But it's, 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 it's principles that we live by that Jesus or the Bible never said. And what we're going to have in the month of September is kind of a debunk of some of the thoughts and the principles that we live by that are not actually true. And what this series in September is going to help for us to set up for the month of October is a series that I think I'm going to publicly commit myself to now because we've talked about it as a staff. We've talked about it in our creative meetings where we talk about how to present these messages. We've even talked about it in our diversity and equality group of how we're trying to find ways to bring social justice into the communities around us. And it's a series in October that I don't have a slide for yet because we haven't kind of uh, crafted it. But the idea is going to be the elephant, the donkey, and the lamb. And the illusion is, yes, there's actually three parties running for office this, this November. And you're going to have to vote, you're going to have to cast a vote for one of, one of the donkeys or the, or the elephants. But in reality, you're going to have to bring faith to your vote. And how you bring with your faith to the shortcomings of your particular candidate. So I understand that early battling is going to be made available to Georgia in middle of September, and this series will actually be middle to late of October. So we're not positioning this, this series to help position your vote or, or sway your vote or even educate your vote. In fact, that, it'll be none of that. The reality will be is however you vote, from the local mayor to the president of the United States, you're going to violate Scripture when you cast that vote. Because there aren't candidates that fulfill the absolute nature of Scripture. So you have to have faith in your vote, which is why you've got to go to the polls. But when you bring faith in your vote, then you have to vote your faith because the reality is, is your prayer should be not calling out the sins of the candidate you don't support, but praying for the faith in the shortcomings of the candidate you do support. And that's where the donkey and the elephant have let us down. That's where the lamb's going to have to lift, lift us up in this season. And that's where I'm sad to see our country going the way it has this past week and this past season. And I'll be honest, I don't see a change. I think, I think we're a generation away from scratching the surface. Because at some point, we're going to have to teach the next generation to not carry the sins that we carried from our parents. This country's in the shape it's in because of the generation here now. And we're going to have to realize that Jesus didn't say that. He didn't come across the way that, by and large, our communities communicate on social media. God help me get off social media. Stop making statements on social media, please. Stop making introductions to arguments that you run through the comments and further, I know you've got a great point, but oh my gosh, we are in such peril in our country right now. There's no common union amongst the people of our nation, the people of our world, because we're helping to divide it by positions that we try to hold. At the end of the day, we shouldn't be calling out the sins of others. We should be lifting up in faith the trouble and the hope that that God can overcome the sins of those that we love the most. And that's where the church is going to have to come in. So um, as, as, as two presidential nominees stood before their national conventions and received their nominations, I am standing before you and receiving the nomination of bringing that subject in, in, in October. And now you're probably saying, well, preacher, you're going to preach whatever, whatever you want to anyway. No, that's not true. I preach what I feel like you need and I hear that you need and I feel like this is the message we're going to need in October because regardless of who gets elected in November, we're going to have to bring an element of faith to their office that they're not bringing with themselves. 
Because each presidential candidate and all the way down to our local legislation, they're all missing something. And I'm not saying that each and every one of us has the exact answer, but in faith, we're going to have to rally in prayerful support, not calling out the sins, okay? Let's, let's stop mudslinging everybody. Let's start praying for the, the, the holes of our candidates, amen? All right, enough off my soapbox here. I'm coming back down. All right, so back to this passage here in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. It's interesting here that different abilities were given. Certain guys, certain, certain servants who received certain uh, gifts gained and certain fell short. Now, you have to read the whole story. I'm not going to get into the whole story. But there was connections here that advanced and connections here that were, that were cut off. And the reality here is, is this is, in symbolism of iron, the loving bond that God wants to get together with you and celebrate. He wants to see you grow. He wants to see you expand. He believes from where you are, your faith upon faith can be added to where you can grow up and grow out from where you are. And why I know that is true is not only from a faith perspective, but also from an anatomical perspective. We're reading this book right now as a staff called Deep Work, and it talks about how to shut off the distractions, how to, part of the book is literally taking a 30-day vacation from social media so that you can disconnect from all things that grab your attention. You can actually focus in on the deep work that you're being called to accomplish, that through long periods of concentration, you can actually grow in your ability to focus more clearly. And the book gets into a physiological aspect of your body that the brain synapses, the millions upon billions of brain synapses that exist in your body that send impulses across those synapses of how you tell your body and your mind to do things can be strengthened. This is kind of funny. The book says that a fatty tissue can grow over those synapses, helping you to engage in that thought process more regularly because it creates an insulation so you can go back to that thought pattern. The more you practice it, the more it gets strengthened, the more you can repeat that thought pattern. So if you've ever had a bad habit that you wanted to break, the point is to focus your mind on breaking the habit, not sitting in the habit, because the longer you do the habit, the more the fatty tissue insulates that habit synapse, the more you keep recreating that poor habit. But if you can focus on the right thing, that synapse grows and gets stronger. Now, those of you trying to lose weight and say, well, Pastor, that's why I don't do deep work. That's why I don't focus, because I'm adding more brain fat. I can't take any more fat anywhere. But I'm calling you to grow in your ability because God wants to celebrate the fact that he geared your body and your mind to grow in that particular aspect. Isn't that good news? <laughs> okay, I just blew your mind scientifically. I was in a pre-med program before I got saved. That blows my mind because when I sit down and think, I think, God, you, you actually want to create a loving bond with me that is sharpened by others if I'll just focus on the things I need to focus on, of how I can have a weight in my life that straightens and strengthens myself to where I can celebrate with you and not fall to the wayside and fall away in, in isolation away from others. So how are we going to be strengthened by others? How are we going to be strengthened um, uh, through the, the relationship, the countenance, the wit, the person of others? As iron sharpens iron, number one, we've got to have to look at ourselves. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look at the internal heat that's going to have to become part of our life that will bring the molding process by which the iron sharpening iron is the illustration of. You can't sharpen iron until you heat the natural elements of it to where it becomes hot. It becomes hard to handle. It becomes uncomfortable. But in that, as the heat gets raised in your own life, you now become pliable to be able to be done something with. There's a passage here in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19, that God is speaking to his people in the Old Testament. He says, I will break down your... <laughs> He talking to you, and he talking to me. He's going to break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron. Interesting how he wants to take iron to sharpen iron and break the iron out and off and away from your life. In other words, when it comes to our financially drained feeling of life right now, do you even know where you are financially? Now, if you're married and it's, it's the spouse that kind of carries the finances, I get it because, you know, pardon the pun, there's, there's kind of a, a yin to our yang, and it's okay if you're not the financially minded person in your relationship. But if neither you of you are, then you need to invite someone in that can help speak to you the financial forecast of where you are. Otherwise, the sky is going to fall like iron in your life, and you're never going to have the freedom from that drained feeling that you want to have. 
You've got to have a road map and a plan that you're trying to, 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 to go down. I had a friend at one point who um, had a really good job, made really good money that required him to travel quite a bit, but his finances were a wreck. And he couldn't carry a personal credit card, but the job required him to, to more or less personally expense all of the, all the expenses he had when he traveled. He'd come back to the receipts in and get reimbursed. So because he didn't have a credit card and because he didn't have the cash to kind of float that kind of expense from report to report, he'd go on these business paid trips and not be able to eat dinner and sleep in the hotel on an expense paid trip where he doesn't have the expense to actually eat. It's like, bro, you can't live like this. He goes, well, I just, I don't know where we're at. We haven't paid our taxes in five years. And this was his phrase to me. I don't even want to look at it. It's like, well, man, you... You can't get out of where you're at in this uncomfortable, drained feeling until you get your hands on it. Well, me and my wife are just not good at it. Well, then, then invite someone into the story to help walk you through it. The courage to face the change that is needed is not the, uh, the idea that, well, I just won't ever look at it. That doesn't take courage. That, that's the isolation that's draining you. But you're going to have to engage it. You've got to heat some things up a little bit inside of yourself where iron can strike iron and the friend cannot bring about the countenance of a friend. Someone say amen. amen. Secondly, for iron to get sharpened, something's got to happen within our family. When I say our family, is once you get heated up in within yourself, here's where the sparks fly, <laughs> where the iron actually strikes the other iron that's hot and malleable and been exposed to some things, and, and some, some collisions are taking place inside of your relationships and your marriage and, 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 and your family. And there will be some collisions over how we spend money, and we kind of have to collide in those conversations to realize how to strengthen and sharpen ourselves. Until you have those collisions, you don't know where you're out of financial shape, where you haven't gardened the edge that will be pliable for you to go about what God has called you to do. Deuteronomy chapter 4 here, verse 20, another iron passage here. God speaking to people in the Old Testament says, But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smeltering furnace. And this is a place of Egypt where bondage and the feeling of draining was taking place. So he took him out of the iron smeltering furnace, out of Egypt to... So he was helping to form them and create them into the shape to become the people of his inheritance, of his calling that he knew they, they would be in, 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 the, in the future. But it took the becoming, the, 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 the forming, the shaping. It took the process of colliding and, 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 and coming through the sparks of that process for the sharpening to happen. You know the phrase that the, the honeymoon is over, and it's kind of funny because you can all remember inside of your marriage or relationships where the, where the honeymoon kind of ended. So for Tara and I, it was an awesome honeymoon. We went to the Florida it was an awesome seven-day vacation. Got back, I guess, on day eight, if you will, to our little apartment in Grand Haven, Michigan. And, and for the first time, it was our mail, right? Like, we went out to the mailbox together, got our mail. It wasn't my mom, like, putting the junk mail at my place at the table anymore. It was our mail at our apartment together. There was this one envelope, and it said credit card payment. Open immediately. I was like, what is this? Tara and I grew up totally different ways of, of, of how we handled money, totally different experiences. I had never had a credit card. I was 24 years old. So I opened the credit card, and it's a $4,000 credit card bill. I was like, well, like, what is this? Like, I don't even know. I feel like I'm reading German right now. She goes, well, how do you think we paid for the wedding? I was like, in cash, how you pay for everything, right? She goes, the flowers, the, 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 the pictures, the cake, all that kind of stuff we put on a credit card. And the honeymoon was over, right? Like, like we, we had our first financial conversation. And it's funny because I'm the saver, she's the spender, and through 19 years of marriage that we'll celebrate next week. God bless you, baby. We made it. The honeymoon is back on. It's back going again. Woo! All right. But we, <laughs> we, had, to, we had to fine-tune some aspects of our life because we had not created our, I don't know how we missed that part of our, of our pre-marriage counseling. We never got into how we handled finances. That was a really, really rude awakening for both of us. We just did not anticipate that. But for us, we had to become the people that God had called us to become. And for you, you got some clanging, some hitting, some sparks are going to fly, some collisions are going to take place for you to become the people God has called you to be. Amen? So after you look at yourselves, after you begin the collision with your family, number three, you've got to realize that all this forming is for others. All this shaping, all this remaking 
And probably the reason you feel drained today is because you've become a dam and, and a, a fortified source of kind of keeping your resources to yourself. That God never intended you to be an a inlet of, of, of income only, but he wants you to be an outlet of having a life formed for something brand new to help serve others. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 50 and 51 says this, And forgive your people who may have sinned against you, for they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out of Egypt, out of your iron smeltering furnace. So here's this passage where God is trying to speak to those who've come out of Egypt to now focus on those who have not come along the journey yet. Please forgive those. They're still your children, but they stand divided from your kingdom and your purpose and your plan. God, help us through heating up of ourselves and the collision with those we love the closest to become a source that helps sharpen others and lifts the face of someone else. We break down our stubborn pride to become the people for the thems and the theys that God is calling us to help reach. And there's where we really understand that when we feel drained, it's because we're stopped up. It's because we haven't become an outlet for others. Our mind is only positioned on how we can help satisfy our own financial need, and we haven't figured out how to be a bridge and a gap for somebody else. Maybe your, your bridge is being a conversation to someone. Hey, I've, I've seen you have some stresses and carrying some weights that I remember when I was in that same place. C can I help to speak to that? May maybe, your, maybe your place is, is, is leading a life group or leading a watch party online so where you can help bring others along in their faith. Maybe your gap of no longer feeling drained is, is to begin the process of being a contributor, of being a financial investor to the kingdom of God that's happening in the life around you because you're, you know that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an outlet for you, but it's a source of, of, of you hanging on to what you think is yours. But as we look back at that scripture in Matthew, it's his money anyway, so how are we handling it? The whole idea, the whole principle of what is his is how we handle it for him. And it's the only way he responds to us by saying, good and faithful servant. It's more than just your giving. It's how you handle everything. It's how you handle the whole kit and caboodle. Do you need that thing? Should you be saving that much or should you be saving more? It's how you handle the whole aspect. My hope is this, that you'd find a source to where you're no longer drained, but you're fulfilled because you sense the empowerment of the sharpening of the iron, the, str the, the, the strength of a, of a bond that carries you through the difficult times, well past your sixth year, well past your 19th year, and all the way into the place where God is receiving you. So in a moment, I want to pray for us, and my hope is that if you're here in attendance or you're watching online, that if there's any kind of separation or gap for you in your relationship with God, that through this prayer, you can shore that up, you can seal that. You can be reminded again that he loves you. He wants to celebrate with you. He wants to celebrate together. He wants to invite you into his plan so you can be sharpened for his purpose to help raise the countenance and the wit and the person of his people. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me today? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence, to celebrate who you are, and to realize that once again, God, you have called us to live in an experience with you. God, before we can be a gap or a, a bridge for someone else, we have to realize you first came to us to satisfy our sinful nature, to realize that, God, you've called us to a higher purpose and plan, to be fulfilled by your love, forgiven by your mercy. So through this prayer, God, reconnect us to you. Church, with your heads bowed, your eyes still closed. If you're in person or online, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you today. And I'm tired, I feel separated, I feel disconnected, and completely isolated. So help me to realize that you first came to save me, to set me free, to fill up my holes, to embrace me with others so I can be strengthened and sharpened in my salvation, so I can help share you with others. So this day, Lord, set me apart as a child of God, received by you, forgiven and set free. In Jesus' name. Every head still bowed, every eye still closed. If you said that prayer in this room here today, 
you said that prayer online, I'm going to ask you either to raise your hand on the count of three here in person, or you chat amen online, allowing our team to reconnect with you online to see how we can help you take a next step. If that's you today, if you said that prayer in person or online, and you just need to connect with Jesus in some way, on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand up towards heaven. The count of three, one, two, three. I see that hand. God bless you. You can put your hand down. I see that hand in the back. God bless you. For those of you viewing online, you can comment amen in the chat section there, allowing our team to reconnect with you to see what that next step might be. For all of us, a step might be to, to sign up for water baptism. And that, you, that, uh, that QR code that's on the tabletops there, or if you go online to our website, you can sign up for water baptism. For others of us, it might be signing up for a, a life group or engaging in the growth track. There's some kind of step for us. But whatever your step might be, you have to take that first step to be sharpened by someone else. So, Father, this day, I pray that you can help to engage with us and what that step would be so we would step out and step into what you called us to be. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Now, listen, if you prayed that prayer today, if you're separate in some way, you want to take that step, that QR code that's on the tabletops there, if you take your phone off, scan that with your camera on your phone, it'll take you to a part of our website. You can sign up there for classes. You can, you can sign up to be a, a, a volunteer. You engage with our giving platform there online. That QR code takes you to a kind of a general page on our website to engage in your next step. If you're online, by simply commenting in this comment section, we can follow up with you with our, with our online team and help you take that next step as well. You can't be sharpened by yourself. And you can be in person or watch online and do God and church all by yourself and never find the sharpening he intended for you. There's where we have to engage in more than just worship and a message, but engage with others. So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet here. In a moment, the worship team's going to come. We're going to worship this last song entitled, Such an Awesome God. It's interesting because we sing to a God who's selfless and generous. He's faithful, but in his selflessness and generosity, we have to engage. And by engaging with him, it empowers us and encourages us to engage with others so we can realize that selfishness and that generosity doesn't only come from God, but it comes to us to flow through us into the life of others. So may, may this song encourage us today to truly carry us into that engagement. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship with you, to stand with you, God, to sing a song with you as we walk out of this place, not to be just living inside of this place, God, and to allow our faith to be heightened here, but that, to allow it to be a tidal wave that goes out to saturate our whole community. God, help us in this time, in this place, in this opportunity to be fulfilled by you, to take steps with you, and to walk out of here, encouraged and engaged like never before. God, to truly walk out how you've encouraged us to be sharpened by the life of others so we can sharpen those who want to raise the personhood and the character and the countenance of. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Let's sing with that selfless.